Welcome, brave souls, to a chilling journey into the depths of terror. Brace yourselves as we delve into a spine-tingling tale that will send shivers down your spine. But fear not, for you're not alone on this journey. Join us, subscribe, and hit that like button to support our channel as we uncover the darkness that lies ahead. Let the haunting begin. Story 1. Many people love taking walks in the forest. The fresh air, the whisper of leaves in the wind, the bright rays of the sun, barbecues by the lake, who wouldn't love that, you might ask. Well, I'll tell you, me. A feeling of terror grips me every time I catch the scent of evergreens in the air. My panicked fear of the forest is linked to one incident that I had to go through many years ago. When I was in school, my dad would drive me out to my grandma's place in the country every summer vacation. Like any good country folk, my grandma had chickens, geese, a cow, and my beloved gray horse, Sugar. The village was out in the sticks, and it took a good while to get there. I would have died of boredom on the way, if it weren't for the anticipation of finally seeing Grandma and Sugar. Grandma let me ride in the forest, with the strict order not to venture deep into the thickets. Dad, worried about me, insisted that I stop this activity, saying I was wearing the horse out with all my riding, but Grandma always stood up for me and said that it was even good for Sugar. She herself was no longer able to provide the young and spirited horse with the proper exercise, so she approved of my rides. She could never bring herself to send Sugar to the slaughterhouse, knowing how much I loved him. All was well, until I turned 14. That's when I decided I was grown up enough to disobey Grandma's order and go explore the deep forest on my own. On that fateful day when all my troubles began, I felt an unusual surge of energy. I had no desire to just ride around the village for the hundredth time, so I saddled up Sugar and set off to explore the hitherto unknown part of the forest. By that time, we completely trusted each other, and I was certain he would never throw me off. I must say, the ride started out magical, except for the fact that Sugar was behaving quite restlessly. He kept perking up his ears and nervously sniffing the air, as if sensing something very unpleasant nearby. I didn't think much of it figuring the horse was just anxious about being in an unfamiliar place. We rode at a walking pace along the trail. I looked up. The bright midday sun filtered through the branches and leaves, creating intricate lacy shadows. The birds were singing in a ringing chorus, frogs were croaking contentedly on the lily pads in the pond. A nearby stream gurgled pleasantly. The crystal clear water sparkled with a thousand diamonds. We kept going deeper and deeper into the thicket. I smiled joyfully, took a deep breath of the evergreen scent, and sank into carefree thoughts. I was so lost in daydreaming that I didn't notice the world around me rapidly changing. I pulled on Sugar's reins to stop him, and looked around. It was still a forest, the sun was still there, but an aching feeling of unease washed over me, and I finally realized what was wrong. The forest was deathly silent. All sounds had been suddenly switched off, as if by command. Just a moment ago, a symphony was playing all around, and now, nothing. We stood there for about five minutes. I had a distinct feeling that we were being watched. Suddenly, I heard a loud clicking sound. I couldn't tell where exactly it was coming from, the sound seemed to be coming from all directions at once. I became truly frightened. I pulled Sugar's reins to turn him around and gallop back home, away from this nightmare, but the horse wouldn't obey. Sugar was nervously stomping his hooves. Every muscle in his body was tense, like a drawn bowstring. He perked up his ears and stared intently into the depth of the forest. I followed his gaze. At first I saw only the impenetrable thicket, but then I looked closer and my blood froze in my veins. Hiding behind one of the fir trees, on all fours, was a deathly pale, hairless creature. Judging by how deeply it was bent at the knees and elbows, I can say it was very tall. If the creature were to straighten up, it would be no less than two meters high. Though it's doubtful it could even stand on its feet, as its feet were heavily curved. The creature's knees were bent backwards, like an animal's. Its arms and fingers seemed unnaturally long. Its feet and palms were covered in thick fur. Even then, it seemed strange to me that despite the complete lack of wind, this fur was swaying in different directions. The creature was resting on its fists, like a gorilla, and staring at us. Suddenly, Sugar neighed loudly, sharply turned around, and galloped at full speed back towards home. As we were riding, I heard the clicking sounds behind us, but nothing was chasing us. 
I collected branches and leaves in my face, but I didn't care. When I returned home, luckily, Grandma was visiting a neighbor. I was ashamed that I had broken her order and didn't even warn her where I was going. I decided it would be best to pretend nothing had happened. I put sugar in the stall, fed him some sugar, as strange as it may sound, treated the scratches on my face with peroxide, and lay down on the bed with a book. Evening came, time to go to bed. I changed into my pajamas, turned off the light, and looked at the starry sky. I was so glad that Sugar and I had escaped. But I celebrated too soon. Just as I was about to step away from the window, I froze in my tracks, my eyes wide as saucers at what I saw outside. Despite the pitch darkness, I somehow managed to make out that creature. It was just staring at me, but made no move to approach. I recoiled from the window and crouched down, listening intently to the night silence. I was afraid the creature would come up to the house, but I heard no footsteps. There was a wall clock. I looked at it and, judging by the time, I had been crouching under the window for twenty minutes. I carefully stood up and peeked out, the creature was still sitting there, staring at me. Terrified, I sank back down to the floor, wondering what to do. In the end, I didn't even notice when I fell asleep right there on the carpet under the window. In the morning, I looked out the window first thing, the creature was gone. I sighed with relief, got dressed and went to the kitchen, drawn by the smell of fresh pies. Over breakfast, I realized that sleeping on the cold floor had given me a chill. I had a slight fever, a cough and a runny nose. There was no way I could go riding, and to be honest, I was glad about that. I took some medicine, went outside and sat on the bench that Dad had made from a log. I was basking in the sun when I suddenly had the urge to look towards the forest. There it was again, that creature, sitting motionless among the trees and staring at me. I was about to panic, but then a thought occurred to me, it's not attacking me, just watching. Maybe I should just ignore it. It's had plenty of chances to kill me, but it hasn't. So maybe it doesn't want to. I pretended the creature wasn't there and went about my business as usual. From that day on, I would spot it here and there, hiding behind the juniper bush as I watered the garden, peeking from the bushes as sugar and I rode around the village, visible in the window at night as I read my book. This went on until August, and then the creature suddenly stopped visiting me. For a whole week I didn't see it, and it seemed I had finally bored it. I was overjoyed, tomorrow dad was supposed to come and take me back to the city so I could get ready for school. Feeling carefree, I decided to take one last ride on sugar, but this time I didn't want to go into the forest thicket, opting instead for the meadow next to the woods where the old pasture used to be. I saddled up sugar and we leisurely made our way to the meadow. I let the reins go and let sugar graze on the lush grass. I felt sad that I would be parting with my best friend for a whole year. I lay back on sugar, my back against the saddle, and gazed up at the sky. The sweet scent of flowers filled the air, Bees were buzzing here and there, and Sugar was swishing away the insects with his magnificent tail. I smiled and peacefully closed my eyes. But I was not allowed to savor the pleasant moment. The sounds around me suddenly grew quiet again, and then I heard the familiar clicking sound. I knew what was coming, got up, put my feet back in the stirrups, and my heart skipped a beat at what I saw. Dozens of those creatures, big and small, were emerging from the forest, staring at us with unblinking eyes. They just stood there among the trees, gawking at us. This time, Sugar didn't hesitate. The horse loudly neighed, reared up, and galloped home as fast as he could. I almost fell out of the saddle. Suddenly, I heard a dull thudding sound behind us, as if something large and heavy was pounding the ground. I looked back and saw something that still makes me stutter to this day. One of the creatures was chasing us. It would alternately straighten its arms and legs. I looked closer at the creature's palms, what I had taken for fur was actually a cluster of tiny tentacles. The distance between us was rapidly closing. In one second, the monster leaped forward and latched its tentacles onto Sugar's leg. The horse neighed in pain, but managed to give the creature a good kick. The thing flew about five meters, did an involuntary somersault in the air, and remained lying on the ground, apparently Sugar had hit it in the head. Soon the monster disappeared from view and we somehow made it back home. I told Grandma a lone hungry wolf had attacked us. I was ashamed to lie to her, but I couldn't tell the truth either. We treated Sugar's wounds. He had just lost some skin, 
but the vet was seriously alarmed by the fact that his blood was black. The next day, dad came and took me to the city. A week later, grandma called me in tears to say that sugar had died. My heart was broken, and in February, grandma passed away from a stroke. I hadn't been back to the village for many years after that. By the time I finished college, the place had become deserted. The villagers had all moved to the nearest cities, leaving their homes to nature. When I turned 26, I gave in to the memories and decided to go back for a day. I drove the familiar road, parked the car in the yard, and looked around. We never sold the house, no one wanted to buy it. This is where I had spent my carefree childhood. The wrought iron fences of the corrals were covered in thick rust and creaked ominously in the wind. The house stared at me with its empty dark windows. There's where grandma used to milk the cow. And there's my bed where I slept every summer. And here's the chicken coop, from which the loud crowing of our rooster used to come every morning. And right here, grandma would cook the meals and call me to the table. Happy, carefree childhood, now so far away. No more the aroma of grandma's pies, no more grandma, no more sugar. Thinking of sugar, I went to the barn. The pleasant scent of hay had long since dissipated, the stall door was rotten and fallen off, the plastic feed trough looked like it was begging to be filled with grain, and Sugar's brush was lying alone on the chair. I picked it up, hugged it to my chest, sat on the chair, and cried. I wanted to turn back the clock to before that fateful day when I had the foolishness to ride into the thicket. But what's done is done, no use dwelling on the past. I didn't notice how dawn was breaking. I had to hurry, or I'd be getting home well after midnight, and I did want to get some sleep. I got in the car, started the engine, and glanced in the rearview mirror, and was horrified. In an instant, the nightmare of the past returned with renewed force, the memories hitting me like an electric shock. In the mirror, I saw that pale, bald freak staring at me. It opened its wide mouth, full of long sharp teeth, and made that clicking sound, then lunged at me. I floored the gas pedal, spun the wheels for a couple seconds, and sped away from there down the old dirt road. Suddenly, the freak jumped onto the trunk of the car and tried to smash the rear window. Luckily, there was a sharp turn just ahead of me. I have no idea how I managed to pull off that maneuver without flying off the road, but I succeeded, the creature was thrown off the car. It tried to chase me, but the car had reached its top speed, and I drove away from there. Later, I was pulled over by the cops and fined for speeding. Seeing my pale face and shaking hands, they probably thought I had been partying all night, but luckily, it all worked out. The fine was a hefty one, but I was ready to hug those cops. I made it home without incident. I've never gone back to that village since. The creatures don't seem to manifest themselves anymore, apparently they stayed there in the forest. Although it all ended well, the mere suggestion of going for a walk in the woods or a barbecue still makes me shudder. My friends don't understand my fear, but they don't need to know anything. I remember all too well the horror I went through, and I don't want it to happen again. Story 2 It had to be said, Jack never really had much of a taste for foraging for wild edibles. He just didn't understand the fanatical desire some of his friends had to scour the woods for hours hunting mushrooms or bent over picking berries. But twice a year, he would go out berry picking himself. The first time, in September, Jack would happily enjoy the last days of Indian summer, collecting buckets of cranberries in the pine forest. The second trip was less enjoyable. They went for the lingonberries in October. The bare trees greeted them with an unwelcoming chill. On the bog, there were often puddles, especially in the mornings, covered in a thin layer of ice. Jack considered anything else besides cranberries and maybe raspberries to be frivolous. Jack's co-worker, Jerry, had a reputation as an herbal medicine expert and knew all the berry hotspots. So even in a poor year, a full bucket was guaranteed on each trip. Jack especially loved the cranberries. They were a nutritional powerhouse, made the most delicious juice, and were an essential ingredient in many of his favorite dishes. And considering the market prices, they were practically free. This year, a couple more co-workers joined Jerry and Jack, so the gas money was barely anything. It was a sunny day, warmer than you'd expect for fall. The colorful leaves had already fully dropped, making the sparse birch grove on the edge of the bog seem almost transparent. The deeper they ventured, the softer the path became underfoot. It felt like the ground was breathing, 
gently yielding and springing back with each step. This year, Jack was much more at ease with the unsettling sensation of the unstable footing and boldly followed Jerry further into the bog. The others stayed near the edge, almost in the woods. They decided to only pick the smaller berries, as long as they could feel solid ground beneath their feet. The even surface increasingly buckled with hummocks, with dark water pooling between them. Some openings shone like mirrors, others were blanketed in duckweed and algae. Jerry knew exactly where to go. And then before their eyes spread an unexpectedly green, four-fall, meadow. On the mossy hummocks, amidst the grass, the ripe cranberries seemed to have been scattered by a generous hand. Jerry pointed out the berry-laden clearing to Jack and unhurriedly moved on. He never stayed in one spot. He wandered all day, collecting not just berries but also various herbs and roots. For those Jerry took with him, there was one rule, don't leave the meadow. The experienced guide seemed to sense when it was time to move to a more fruitful spot, and he would escort the inexperienced pickers himself. Finding his way back to the right place was never a problem for him. Jack eagerly and joyfully collected the juicy, firm berries, like beads strung on a delicate thread. Not even the low, dark clouds rolling in could dampen his mood. The thickening chill seemed to warn of a cold, drizzling rain. But this did little to concern the man, the berries were plentiful this year, so they would quickly gather as much as they needed and head home. Maybe they'd even be done before the rain started. In less than two hours, the basket was nearly full. Choosing a drier hummock, Jack sat down to rest. Bliss surrounded him. Silence. There were very few trees in this spot. Here and there stood stunted, thin, and sickly-looking birches and cedars. As if, having risen above the bog's edge, they had forever lost the right to reach for the sky. Jack noticed a cedar about ten yards from his little clearing. Its scrawny top was adorned with large cones. Oddly, the cedars growing in the bog almost always had unusually large, juicy kerneled cones. Jack leisurely approached the tree and shook the slender trunk. Five or six cones tumbled into the withered grass. Not bad. The kids would get a nice little treat from the rabbit. The ripe fruits, touched by the first frosts, were not sticky with sap. Jack pocketed the cones, smiling at the thought of the boy's delight. Up ahead, a bit further, two birches leaned towards each other, arching to form a window. And beyond it, the city dweller even caught his breath in delight. The small clearing seemed to be covered in a red carpet. Stepping as carefully as possible, Jack made his way to the middle of the berry bounty. He smiled, his chest swelling with joy. His thoughts scattered, as if the man were slightly intoxicated. Taking the next step, he nearly fell flat on his face. His leg plunged in up to the knee, and cold water flooded his boot. Jack gasped, hastily yanking his leg from the hole. His heart raced with surprise and a slight fear. His temples throbbed with a dull ache, his limbs felt heavy. As if waking from a dream, Jack looked around in bewilderment. Beneath his feet, the springy carpet was gone. Tufted grass heads stuck up all around, between them glimmering dark water. The stench of algae and damp was strong. Jack just couldn't figure out how he'd ended up here. A kaleidoscope of horror movie scenes, internet facts, and stories about mystical bog creatures flashed through his mind. Kelpies, will-o'-the-wisps, the restless souls of the drowned, luring travelers into the mire. Jack felt a murky, cold wave of fear and panic rise from his churning stomach to his chest, constricting his breathing and pounding his pulse. Hey Jerry! Jack yelled. A pathetic, hoarse bleat escaped his throat. The sound of his own terrified, raspy voice frightened Jack even more. Goosebumps prickled his skin and cold sweat beaded on his brow. Weir, came a faint call from somewhere to the side. Relief and gratitude washed over Jack in a wave. He was even flushed with heat. I'm here. Coming to you, he shouted back, his voice now loud and assured. Carefully choosing his steps, but moving with some haste, Jack hurried towards the sound. It was very uncomfortable to walk. The tall hummocks, like cantankerous horses, kept throwing him off. He had to pick his way between them, through sparse bushes that snagged at his clothes, or across the water, feeling for solid ground in the cold depths. Jack called out to his friend several more times. Up ahead, he thought he heard a response. On one of the hummocks, Jack spotted a snapped, thin birch trunk. 
The broken stem was a bit thick and heavy, but it would serve well to test the depth ahead of him. Even with the stick, Jack plunged into the cold water again and again. At times he waded nearly waist deep, struggling to wrench his legs from the boggy muck. Finally, he glimpsed a cluster of slender, pale birches standing out amid the bog's grayness. Jack's spirits lifted, that must be a relatively solid island. Collapsing to his knees on the welcome dry ground, he panted to catch his breath. His soaked clothes steamed. The exertion had him feeling no chill. Recovering a bit, Jack rose and began shouting Jerry's name, turning this way and that, cupping his hands to amplify the sound. Despairing of getting an answer, he looked around. The island was ringed by hummocks and water on all sides, but to one side the vegetation grew thicker, a tangled, spiny bush. Feeling despair well up in his throat, but still determined, Jack plunged forward. When he sank in up to his chest, he remembered he had left his pole back on the island. But he didn't turn back. Clawing his way through the undergrowth, Jack finally emerged. Looking around, he saw no sign of Jerry. Tears of frustration and fear streaming down his dirty cheeks, he yelled Jerry's name over and over, his voice cracking. Suddenly, to his right, almost behind him, he heard a loud, hey. A belated jolt of fear shot through him, phew, almost missed that. Gasping with relief, Jack hurried towards the sound. If he had the energy, he might have run. As it was, he stumbled along, muttering, Jerry, I'm coming, just hang on, as if his friend could hear him. The ground beneath his feet became spongy, the tangle of roots and grasses providing more steady footing, though still occasionally breaking through and plunging him into the icy water. Several times Jack had to stop and shout, getting no response. Despair crept up his throat again, but he steeled himself and pressed on. Suddenly, to his right, the call sounded again, much closer this time. Sobbing with relief, Jack surged forward. Bursting into a small clearing surrounded by thin, pale birches, he dropped to his knees, panting. His legs trembled with exhaustion, steam rising from his sodden clothes. In that moment, he felt only gratitude, not the cold. Catching his breath, Jack rose and began shouting Jerry's name, turning and projecting his voice. After several calls with no answer, he looked around. The island was ringed by hummocks and water on all sides, but to one side the vegetation grew thick and thorny. Feeling despair welling up in his throat but still determined, Jack plunged forward. When he sank in up to his chest, he remembered he had left his pole back on the original island. But he didn't turn back. Clawing his way through the undergrowth, Jack finally emerged into a small clearing. Looking around, he saw no sign of Jerry. Tears of frustration and fear streaming down his dirty cheeks, he yelled Jerry's name over and over, his voice cracking. Suddenly, to his right, almost behind him, he heard a loud, hey. A belated jolt of fear shot through him, phew, almost missed that. Gasping with relief, Jack hurried towards the sound. If he'd had the energy, he might have run. As it was, he stumbled along, muttering, Jerry, I'm coming, just hang on, as if his friend could hear him. The ground beneath his feet became spongy, the tangle of roots and grasses providing more steady footing, though still occasionally breaking through and plunging him into the icy water. Several times Jack had to stop and shout, getting no response. Despair crept up his throat again, but he steeled himself and pressed on. Suddenly, to his right, the call sounded again, much closer this time. Sobbing with relief, Jack surged forward. Bursting into a small clearing surrounded by thin, pale birches, he dropped to his knees, panting. His legs trembled with exhaustion, steam rising from his sodden clothes. In that moment, he felt only gratitude, not the cold. Despite extensive searches, even with drones, there were no results. But no one had really expected to find anything. The bog was just too dangerous and treacherous a place. Jerry blamed himself for taking Jack out there. And he just couldn't understand, why had Jack wandered off into the depths, leaving his things behind on the meadow where he was supposed to wait. Story 3 I was still a freshman at the University of Colorado in those days. I could be described as scrawny, short, even now I'm only 5 feet 9 inches, exhausted, but thrilled that my first semester exams were aced. That winter, the snow was piled knee-deep. I was headed home for the break needing to take an intercity bus. My dad drove for a different route, but he had arranged with a colleague to give me a free ride home from the station. 
but he didn't. This jerk apparently wanted to get back at my dad for something, though of course I had no idea what. Right in front of the other passengers, he dumped me out on the highway near some little town, into a snowdrift. Not a single person in that bus even said a word. They just sat there while I scrambled to gather my bags as the bus drove off. There I stood in the pitch black, giant pine stretching up towards the sky, not a streetlight in sight, just an old, snow-buried bus stop shelter, and the temperature at least minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank goodness I'd at least had the sense to wear my felt boots. I wasn't really scared, just stunned, confused, and in shock. A numb, silent shock that kept me from panicking. Plodding through the drifts, I made my way to the shelter, as he tossed me about 50 yards down the shoulder. It was bitterly, bitterly cold. I was frozen to the bone. But even so, I didn't despair, I calmly called my mom. The cell signal was weak and it took a couple tries to get through. I have to admit, a fleeting thought crossed my mind, what if there was no signal at all? Mom was frantic, immediately calling my dad, who was still at work. He in turn called the driver from the last run. Luck was on my side, he was right behind and would scoop me up in about half an hour. Soon after, a semi pulled up and the driver noticed me alone at the stop at this hour. He offered me a ride, but I told him help was coming. Then he asked if I'd like to wait in the warmth of his cab, and against all better judgment, I agreed. First of all, the guy seemed perfectly sane, and when he heard my situation he also started clucking and fussing, checking that I'd reached my parents. And secondly, I was absolutely freezing. Everything inside me had gone numb. I needed to be off my feet for at least another half hour. So I was only too glad to thaw out in the toasty cab. As I defrosted, the trucker shared a few long-haul stories. Of course, he didn't just launch into them unprompted, after learning what had happened and marveling at the cruelty of that bus driver, he said he'd seen a lot of cruelty in his day, and launched into his tales. Story 4 My new acquaintance, a long-haul trucker named Jack, was driving his rig along his usual route. As it grew dark, he pulled off to the side of the road to take a bathroom break. Staying close to the truck, he stepped behind some bushes, leaving the engine running and the headlights on, waiting to get back on the road. While adjusting his pants, Jack suddenly noticed a strange figure watching him from the shadows. Startled, he didn't think much of it at first. But as he started to button up, a naked, disheveled woman emerged from the bushes, stumbling towards him. Her skin was pale, her hair tangled, and her eyes seemed unnaturally blank. There was a dark mark around her neck and cuts and scrapes on her face. She limped heavily on one leg, yet continued to approach him, making eerie, guttural sounds as if trying to speak. Panicked, Jack hurriedly tucked in his shirt and raced back to his truck, not daring to look back. As he recounted the experience to me, his hands were trembling and his fingers drummed nervously on the steering wheel. He said he barely got a good look at the apparition, he was so frightened. It turned out this was the ghost of a young woman who had been brutally murdered years ago in a nearby town. A group of local boys, drunk and aggressive, had abducted her from a dance club, beaten her, and then dragged her into the woods to assault her. Her body was found a week later, covered in leaves in an attempt to hide the evidence. The boys' wealthy and influential parents had shielded them from any real consequences. Jack knew this tragic backstory because he had relatives in that town. He believes the woman's restless spirit remains at the sight of her horrific demise, unable to find peace. Hearing this chilling tale, I was deeply disturbed by the cruelty of these boys and the injustice of the situation. How could anyone commit such heinous acts against another human being, especially an innocent young woman? It's truly horrifying to contemplate. As I rode home, I couldn't stop thinking about Jack's experiences. We drive by these secluded areas every day, unaware of the dark secrets they may conceal. This story has given me a whole new perspective on the world around me. When I got home, my father had resolved the issue with the bus driver who had kicked me out earlier. That reckless driver had since left the company to work freight runs instead. All in all, quite an eventful day. Story 5 The boat drifted calmly towards the shore. On the other side of the shore, a forest and a group of young children were waiting for us. Poor kids. Why on earth did they have to venture into that ill-fated forest? Oh well, nothing to be done about it. Guess I'll have to go look for them. Someone probably thinks I'm a rescue worker or somehow associated with these children. 
Nope. Seriously, I don't really care about the kids themselves. What worries me is the situation. Children have been disappearing in that forest for years now. Solving this mystery is my hobby. A mental exercise after work. Some people prefer beer and football, while I prefer taking walks in the fresh forest air. Why on earth did they have to venture into that ill-fated forest? Oh well, nothing to be done about it. Guess I'll have to go look for them. Someone probably thinks I'm a rescue worker or somehow associated with these children. No. Seriously, I don't really care about the kids themselves. What worries me is the situation. Children have been disappearing in that forest for years now. Solving this mystery is my hobby. A mental exercise after work. Some people prefer beer and football, while I prefer taking walks in the fresh forest air. For years, children have been vanishing without a trace in that forest. Completely gone. Just disappeared into thin air. Usually one or two kids would vanish in the forest per year. And then recently, a whole group went missing. They started assembling a search and rescue team, and I volunteered. They sent us out to comb through the sectors that are very difficult to reach on foot, the forest is virtually untouched, almost virgin. The only way in is by boat. And finally, we docked. All right. Sametsky, Pavlov, you and your group search sectors A, B, and C, Strelnikov, your group gets sector D. The rest of you, you're coming with me to search sectors E and F. Any questions? No. Great. The sooner we find them, the better. And for heaven's sake, keep in touch. We don't need to be searching for you all out here too. Let's go. That's our boss, Stefan Hendricks. Overall a good guy. Just a bit gruff, which is understandable in this situation. We split into small groups and started looking for any signs of the children's presence. To no avail. We dug through every pile of dirt, every hollow tree and bush, nothing. The other groups weren't having any luck either. Where are these kids? The day was fading into evening. We needed to head back to the shore to regroup and plan our next steps. And of course, we lost contact with Strelnikov's group. Sametsky, your group is closest to the last known location of Strelnikov's group. Go there and find out what happened to them. And when you do, park them on stumps with their bare butts until they remember to use the radio and stay in touch. Got it, came the response over the radio. After a threat like that, they definitely won't be coming out of the forest, quipped one of the members of our group, Ignadia. Ignadia. One more joke like that from you and I'll personally sit you on a stump with your bare ass until you can't sit anymore. You understand me? Understood, Stefan Hendricks, Ignatiuk replied. The guy just loves to crack jokes, what can you do? Half an hour later, we lost contact with Sametsky's group. The boss is furious. Stalking around, bellowing at the top of his lungs, loud enough that Pavlov's group asked him over the radio to pipe down. Pavlov, just start heading back to the shore. If we lose you too, it's gonna be a complete clusterfuck, Hendricks answered. Got it, just calm down. Can't be restoring those nerve cells, you know. Yeah, I know. Over and out. He then turned to us and said we were going to go search for Sametsky's and Strelnikov's groups. Lovely. We reached the last known location of Sametsky's group just as it was getting dark. No trace. Absolutely nothing. As if no one had ever been there. The last known location of Strelnikov's group yielded the same results. And on the way back, we got a little surprise. Following the markers we had left earlier and the map, we unexpectedly found ourselves back at the last spot where Sametsky's group was last detected. Repeated attempts led us back to the same place we started, we were going in circles. Night fell. Suddenly, the radio and GPS died. Ignatiuk also disappeared. We were wandering aimlessly. 1 AM. Two more people from our group vanished. We were lost. 3 AM. Two more people gone. Just me and Hendricks left. Where is the way out of this forest? 4 AM. I'm the only one left. No way out. 6 AM. I made it back to the shore. There were three people there. Is this Pavlov's group? I asked, almost expecting a different answer. 
You could say that, the gloomy guy messing with the boat replied. So I take it this is Hendrick's group? That's the one, I replied half jokingly. So what now, the guy who had been leaning against the tree spoke up. What now? Maybe they just got lost in the dark. We'll look for them in the morning, the gloomy boatman answered. The four of us, the nervous girl fiddling with her hair by the boat said. No way, I cut in. Hey, what exactly happened to you all? What happened? What happened is that damn forest swallowed our whole squad. This isn't some nature-loving pedophile maniac. This is something truly horrific, the girl shrieked. Maybe they just got lost, the tree-hugging guy offered. If that was the case, they definitely wouldn't be silent like this. Right? I said. The others nodded. Alright, let's wait a bit longer and then get the hell out of here. Maybe someone will show up. They'll be combing the forest with helicopters tomorrow. Maybe they'll spot them, the boatman said, settling down in the sand. That's what we did. Waited until morning. No one showed up. The forest answered with only eerie silence. At 7 a.m., we cast off from the shore. The helicopters found nothing. The four search groups, nearly intact, had been consumed by that damned forest. Or so I thought. A week later, a guy in camo stumbled out of the forest, in a completely unhinged state. It was Stefan Hendricks. He was mumbling something about an all-consuming forest and spirits demanding blood. The result is known, he's now in the loony bin. The children were never found. What kind of forest is this? Story 6. It was a chilly autumn night when my sister and I found ourselves having one of those deep, meandering conversations that can stretch on for hours. Sitting in the cozy warmth of her kitchen, we talked about everything under the sun, the kind of conversation that leaves you feeling content and at peace. As the night wore on, we decided to venture out for a walk, even though the clock was creeping towards 2 a.m. The moon was obscured by clouds, but we headed towards the nearby pond. On the way, we came across a dense patch of woods lining the road. Being a bit buzzed and feeling a little adventurous, we decided to wander into the dark forest, despite the late hour. At first, the forest walk was kind of interesting. But as we pressed deeper, my sister's phone died and I was thankful I had brought a portable charger. As we made our way down a small ravine, I noticed some strange reddish-brown splotches on the leaves, but I didn't think much of it at the time. Reaching the bottom of the ravine, we decided to head towards the pond. Along the way, we spotted a few old, broken Soviet-era dolls and tattered children's sandals. Must have been an old dump site, I remember muttering, trying to convince myself. Suddenly, my sister stopped in her tracks, a look of sheer terror on her face. I followed her gaze and my heart sank, the mutilated remains of some large animal lay scattered across the ground. Piecing it together, I realized those strange splotches I had seen were blood. We both let out a string of curses, overwhelmed by a sense of dread. Stealing my nerves, I grabbed my sister's hand and forged ahead. Eventually, we stumbled upon what appeared to be an old, abandoned root cellar. Without hesitation, I flung open the door and ushered my sister inside. There, in the dim light, we spotted an old, weathered crate. The morbid curiosity was too much, and we moved to open it. What lay inside was an unspeakable horror, a disturbing jumble of decaying children's bodies. We recoiled in shock and disgust, immediately fleeing the cellar. As we ran blindly through the woods, we could hear bone-chilling laughter and shrieks echoing behind us. Somehow, we made it back to my sister's place. The next morning, we packed our bags and left that cursed town, never to return. Story 7 It was a horrifying experience that happened to us about two years ago. As soon as the hunting season opened in the fall, the three of us, myself, Gary, and Oleg, went to the wilderness to hunt moose. We had obtained the proper licenses, all above board. We were headed to a specific location, a small town called Oakwood, not far from where Gary grew up. The roads there are only passable by a good off-road vehicle, and even then not always. There weren't many people, maybe around 20 homes. But the most important person was Old Man Hank. Old Man Hank, or Hank Wilkins as he was also known, was a retired game warden. He was probably in his 70s, but you'd never know it, the man had more energy than men half his age. Hank never complained about his health, 
spending his days in the forest, foraging for berries and pine nuts, only hunting when absolutely necessary. He'd say, I'd rather eat a plain potato than needlessly shoot an animal. We first met Hank years ago when, as young, foolish hunters, we came to the area to hunt bear. Someone had recommended Hank as the best guide, but he took one look at us and refused. The bear is the king of the forest. You fools want to just march in there and try to take him on. And there aren't any problem bears around here anyway. Hank called the dangerous animals, varmints, those that had become too plentiful or started threatening the villagers. He'd hunt those without permits. But he also kept, green, hunters, the kind that just shoot willy-nilly, far away from his forest. We ended up staying with Hank for nearly a month that year, as he taught us how to properly conduct ourselves in the woods, how to avoid trouble and not disturb the inhabitants. He drilled us on hunting, but kept us on a short leash, not letting us venture too far. It took years before we were deemed ready to hunt moose, which is what we had come for that fall. Only Hank wasn't there to greet us. Instead, his limping dog Rusty, a scruffy mutt with a misshapen paw, came running out. We had to go into the house ourselves, where we found Hank Bedridden, a heavy-set woman in her forties sitting by his side. Hank had a high fever that had lasted two days already. He was gaunt and sweating, his eyes sunken. He recognized us and tried to get up, but collapsed back onto the bed. We settled in, brought him some gifts, but didn't drink, Hank didn't approve of that. We decided we may as well go hunting, even without Hank. The old man pleaded with us not to go without him, but we stubborn fellows, all armed, figured what could happen. That's when Hank seriously warned us, if you go past the black rock, stay close to the river. It fears the water. We nodded, though clearly the delirious old man was rambling, what could he mean, it fears water, when we were hunting moose. The next morning, we set out, Rusty the dog accompanying us, as Hank had insisted. Rusty was a sorry looking mutt, but Hank always praised his keen senses. We made our way into the forest, familiar enough with it by now. After a long trek with no luck, we finally came across moose tracks, not too fresh but the only ones we could find. Our tracker was Oleg, not the best but better than the rest of us. He led us on, Rusty limping alongside. Suddenly, the dog stopped and started growling menacingly. We raised our rifles, scanning the area, but saw nothing. Then we heard a strange noise in the forest, not the rustling of leaves or snapping of branches, but a long, eerie wail, like some machine emitting an ultrasonic frequency. It made us want to drop everything and hide, but there was nowhere to go, just the endless trees. The sound grew louder, seeming to approach us. In a panic, Gary fired a couple shots in the direction of the noise, but it made no difference. That's when Rusty had had enough, he took off running, and we instinctively rushed after him, despite cursing the dog for abandoning us. We ran like Olympic sprinters, still fully geared up. The wailing sound faded at first as we ran, but then it started catching up to us. Our heads pounded, vision blurring, but we didn't dare stop. Suddenly, the forest opened up and we tumbled down a gentle slope to the river's edge. Rusty was waiting there, wagging his tail. We felt safe by the water. We laughed at our own fear, had a smoke, even swapped some spooky forest tales. Deciding to head back, we approached the tree lean again, but the wailing sound returned, growing louder the closer we got to the woods. We had to retreat back to the river. So we followed the riverbank all the way back to Oakwood, having to take a huge detour. That eerie sound seemed to be tracking us, as if whatever it was that Hank warned about was waiting for us to wander back into the trees. We made it to the village by the next evening. Hank was doing better, sitting up in bed, still trying to fuss around the house. Of course we told him everything, expecting the old man to explain our terrifying experience. But he just shrugged, probably just the wind. No matter how we pressed him, Hank wouldn't say anything more. He just smiled mysteriously. Rusty sat there calmly, as if backing up his master. The old man had taken the secret of that strange, it, that feared water to his grave when he passed away a few months later, his health finally giving out. We never went back to Oakwood. When Gary would visit his parents, he'd swing by, but said the place just wasn't the same without Hank. And the forest felt foreign, alien to us now. Story 8. It was back in 2011. I'm a horseback rider, literally in love with horses, enamored with them since childhood. 
At the time, my horse, a trotter named Snowflake, was stabled at a forestry station outside of Chicago. We were a whole group, the horses, their owners, and a bunch of enthusiasts who would come on weekends to groom and care for the horses in exchange for riding lessons. The Hinsdale Forest. There's the city, civilization, the suburban homes, and then it all just abruptly ends, giving way to the oak and hickory woods. Even in the height of summer, it was always cool in there. The forestry station itself was situated in a low-lying area, next to a peat-filled pond. To be honest, on a satellite map it looks kind of ominous, like a dark void in the middle of the woods. This used to be a peat mining site, with the holes filling up with water over time. Not the ideal location for a stable, very damp, with a constant battle against mold and mildew in the brick building. There was a small pasture nearby, but it wasn't great either, all muddy underfoot with mint and sedge growing, so we'd have to graze the horses up higher, near the gardening plots. We were there for years, so I'd explored it thoroughly on horseback, by bike, even by motorcycle. It was a fine forest, with mighty hickories and oaks, interspersed with old pines in places. But I always found the forestry station itself unsettling. Riding through the woods was lovely, but once you dropped down into that hollow, it just felt off, made you want to hurry home, or at least back up the hill. Especially creepy at night. It was just a mile and a half walk to the bus stop, but by the time you climbed out of that ravine, you'd be drenched in sweat. It was fine in a group, everyone playing tough, joking around, but alone it was eerie. And there was this bird that would cry out in the evenings, a shrill, unpleasant sound, like a woman or a child wailing or screaming. I went there for five years, winter and summer, sometimes staying overnight. Of course I heard all kinds of things, rustles, strange cries, saw unexplained shadows. But it's the woods. Birds and critters, and weekend partiers leaving their mark. That evening I was riding back alone from the pasture, Snowflake plodding through the forest with her belly full of grass. I was just relaxed, enjoying the woods and the peace. We'd gotten past the stretch I hated, the long downhill, just a bit more to the stables. Suddenly Snowflake lurched, tossed her head, snorted, and started to turn on her haunches. I didn't really understand what could have startled her, nothing seemed unusual. She's a very calm horse, not afraid of cars or dogs, knows this forest like the back of her hoof. And then I saw it. Coming up the hill, nearly at the bottom, was a figure running towards us. A male shape, in dark, loose clothing, like a sweatsuit. He was breathing heavily, with a wheezy, hissing rasp. But above the shoulders, there was nothing. Just the outline of a person, legs and torso clear, but no head. Just empty space where the head should be, blending into the background of the forest. I barely had time to process this and start to get scared when the horse bolted into a gallop. She'd never run like that before. I lost a stirrup, clinging to her mane, eyes wide. There was a big turn with a sandy clearing before the stables, as we rounded it, I risked a glance back, and the figure was still there, about a horse's length behind us. We thundered through the open gates, and the thing just ran straight on into the woods. The mare jumped into her stall and huddled in the corner. I turned on all the lights around the barn, grabbed a pipe, and made myself go close the gates, though I was shaking. Then I unsaddled Snowflake and walked her around, trying to calm her breathing. I was too scared to go near the gates again. I kept muttering to myself, it was just your imagination, just a guy out for a night run, couldn't see his face in the dark. Of course I didn't go home that night. No point going to the ranger's cabin either, he'd probably just be drinking and catching demons in the yard, not much help. I bedded down in a hay and feed tack, and waited for morning. My thoughts were dark. That steep hill, no normal person could run down it that fast, not even at a full sprint. When a horse is galloping, no human sprinter could keep up, not with a horse hitting 30 to 40 miles per hour, taking 20-foot strides. I checked the map later, from the top of the hill to the turn by the gate was exactly 250 yards. Physically impossible for a person to chase us like that. In the twilight, I clearly saw the outline of a person. The face should have been visible, at least as a pale blur. But as the figure ran down the hill, it was hissing and wheezing, and then just vanished into the trees on the other side, without slowing or veering. Where the hell did it go? There's a ditch running along the forest edge there, how did it cross that without a hitch? After this, I was terrified. 
I rushed to finish my chores and get out of there before dark. I tried to time it so I had company. I felt a little better when I moved my horse to a different facility. Story 9. The power cut out at my house in the middle of the night. I was sitting at my laptop when the light in my room suddenly went out and I noticed the computer wasn't charging anymore. I stood up from my chair and walked over to the window. Total darkness. We live on a long road but there are only a few houses in the area. Dense forest across the street. I live out in the country. It's quiet here, I don't like commotion. I like when it's peaceful. My housemates are pretty chill too. A young married couple with a six-year-old son, and an elderly husband and wife. We all live in a two-story cottage that the old folks actually own. Four bedrooms, big living room, study, and a decent-sized kitchen. The oldsters didn't have kids of their own. But the place was too big for just the two of them. They didn't want to sell, so they started renting out rooms to others. That way, not all the cleaning falls on Mildred, that's the wife's name, and she'd have people to chat with in the evenings. I didn't know much about the other neighbors. The houses are pretty spread out. We minded our own business when it came to the people living in them. But that forest, man, it kind of freaked me out sometimes. The wind would whip up, dust swirling, and it was like something from the trees was screaming, howling, calling out for help. Gave me the creeps. Then it would go quiet again and I'd feel normal. Not long ago, after one of those howling episodes, I asked the old folks what those sounds could be. They exchanged looks. Hesitated. I insisted, really pestered them about it, I was so curious. The other tenants were there too, except their son was already asleep upstairs. Come on, tell me what's in those woods. We'll tell ya, if you get out of here, the old man fretted. We'll lose our tenants, the wife sighed. Nonsense. I scoffed. You think I'm some chicken or gullible idiot? The other tenants backed me up. They wanted to know what was so scary about the forest too, since it bugged out the elderly couple so much. After a bit more hemming and hawing, they finally spilled the story. I stared, transfixed, into the inky blackness of the trees. Howling, moaning, sobbing and rustling came from the impenetrable thicket. A loud knocking at my door made me jump. Who's there? It's Jerry, man. I need your help. My neighbor's voice sounded anxious, even scared I'd say. The lights flickered back on. I looked down and saw Jerry's wife Melissa at the front door, wrapped in a shawl. She scurried down the steps, whipping her head around. Flashlight in hand. The power cut out again. What's going on? I asked Jerry, watching the bobbing flashlight beam. Zack's missing. We can't find him anywhere. Help me look. He sounded pathetic, begging me. I should be concerned for my neighbors, eager to assist them, but I'm not convinced it's really Jerry at my door. Or Melissa out there with the flashlight, for that matter. I heard that howling before he showed up, so it could be something else entirely. It's calling out for help, you open the door, and it drags you away. And you're never seen again. Not by anyone still looking, at least. They come out of the darkness. Out of the woods. That's their territory. They disguise themselves as someone you know, a friend, relative. Their aim is to lure you outside. Using all sorts of ploys and deceptions. I'm not sure I can handle whatever this is. If I didn't know about them, they wouldn't have come for me. They only take people who are aware of their existence. And of course, I'm the one who insisted my landlords fill us in on the whole story. Which means I've put not just myself, but my housemates, in danger too. That evening two days ago, like I said, I badgered the elderly couple into telling us about the howling from the woods. All right, all right. Listen up, old Mr. Jenkins said. Our forest is ancient. Lots of stuff's gone down in there over the years. And I don't just mean fires. We've lived here a long time, but, we're old now. Old folks ain't needed by nobody. He paused, seeming to consider his words, then continued. Back in the day, witches used to have their gatherings in those woods. Covens. Sabbaths. There were also rumors of Satanists doing their bloody rituals out there too. Child sacrifices to the devil and all that. Little kid went missing from a house nearby once. 
they searched forever but never found a trace. Word was, the kid got snatched and taken into the forest for some kind of ritual. Caused an awful ruckus back then. The parents were beside themselves with grief. Don't know if it was true or not, but they both turned up missing in that forest later on too. They combed those woods but never discovered any remains, no evidence, nothing. Thing just kind of got brushed aside after a while. Rumors started that it wasn't Satanists who took the kid, that the dad killed him, buried him out there. Then off the mom too, smothered her, before doing himself in. Nobody knew why. Other gossip was that the mom took the kid into the woods herself and abandoned him there. Called her crazy. But the real truth, not a soul alive knows it. After a while, more folks started disappearing. Always heard the howling and crying beforehand. Came from the forest. Sounded like a kid sobbing sometimes. Other times a woman. And that horrible, mournful howling. People were scared to go near those trees, scared of whatever's roaming around out there. Five years back, a woman vanished. Just, gone from her own home one night. She was young, lived with her husband. He was at work that night. When he came back, she was just, gone. Police found what looked like drag marks from the bedroom to the front door, then they got all confused heading off towards the woods. Not many folks lived out this way even back then, but one by one, everybody started clearing out from fear. Only us old-timers stuck around. These, beings, that dwell in the forest. They can come to you, disguised as someone else you know. A friend, relative, what not. You can't open the door for them under any circumstances. Now that you know about them, they know about you too, Mildred muttered gravely. Don't open that door, or they'll snatch you up. Why don't you leave then, if you're scared they'll come for you? I chuckled. Of course I didn't actually believe any of their ridiculous story, nor did my housemates. The old guy gave me a strange look and shook his head solemnly. This is our home, Mildred said. We don't want to leave it. I got that. Nice place, quiet area. No urban hassles. Stories and superstitions didn't faze me. We sat around a bit longer before everyone drifted off to their rooms. My room and the other tenants were upstairs, so we all headed up together while the elderly couple stayed on the ground floor. They're a couple of characters, aren't they? Melissa grinned at me and Jerry, twirling a finger at her temple. We smirked and nodded in agreement. Said goodnight. That night, I was awoken by some strange noises. I listened closely in the darkness. A woman, crying. Coming from outside somewhere. I thought maybe I'd dreamed it at first, but the sobbing just grew louder, rising into a blood-curdling wail. I climbed out of bed and peered through the window. Pitch black out. I heard a commotion in the hallway, then the wailing abruptly stopped. A knock at my door made me jump. Who's there? I called out anxiously. It's me, Je. I need your help man. You seen Zack anywhere? I woke up and he's just, gone. And that horrible screaming from outside. I'm freaking out here. Nah man, I haven't seen him. I just got up myself. Where could he have gone? Maybe he's in the other bedroom with Jerry Jr. No, I already looked. He's sleeping like a log. Strange that the kid slept through that ungodly shrieking. Very strange. Come on man, let me in, Melissa pleaded. I'll just wait here till Jerry gets back. That request struck me as really bizarre. You're better off staying put with your son, I replied through the door. I told you, he's fine, she snapped. I'm freaking out here, Alex. Open up. She was being awfully insistent. Which put me on guard. I hardly knew Melissa at all, but I was pretty sure barging into some guy's bedroom in the middle of the night wasn't her style. I thought back to what the old folks had said, and felt a shiver. What if it wasn't actually Melissa out there? What if it was one of those, those things from the woods? Here for me. No way was I opening that door. Alex? Alex? That pitiful voice carried on, something scratching at my door. Get lost. I yelled. Leave me alone. I'm not letting you in. I backed away from the door and sat on my bed. The scratching stopped. 
everything went dead silent in the house. And outside too. I finally calmed down a bit. Laid back and must have drifted off without realizing it. I woke up the next morning with a killer headache. The night's events seemed like some bizarre dream. But were they? I couldn't be sure. I got dressed, splashed some water. What are you talking about? You were looking for him, right? Asking me to let you in. Melissa finally met my eyes, squinting at me suspiciously. No, Jerry was with me. Why would you think that? My eyebrows shot up in surprise. But you, I mean, someone was at my door last night. You're full of bunk, she accused. You're the one who came pounding on our door in the middle of the night. Scared little Zack half to death with all your hollering and pounding. He couldn't get back to sleep for hours. I just gaped at her like an idiot, completely thrown for a loop. That's a lie. I never left my room. We argued back and forth heatedly for a while. Jerry eventually joined us, just as baffled as the rest of us. I posited that maybe the old couple's warnings were accurate after all. Jerry laughed it off. Melissa just gave me a doubtful look. You think some monster came visiting from the woods to, what, get us to invite it inside? If that's true, it'll probably come back, I nodded grimly. And I hadn't been drinking or anything last night. We all went to our separate rooms, end of story. I stood up from the table, feeling suddenly uneasy. Just hopefully nothing nasty happened to little Zack, Melissa murmured. He doesn't know anything about these, creatures, Jerry reassured her. So they did believe, at least a little bit. That night was relatively calm, just some occasional creaking in the hallway and faint scratching at my window. I pulled the covers over my head and knocked out. The next day I mostly laid around with a lingering headache. Didn't want to see or talk to anyone. But tonight, I heard that crying again at one point, building into a wail. Then the power cut out completely. Jerry was knocking at my door a few minutes later, but I'm scared to open it. Alex, you gonna help me find Zack or what? He's still knocking, more insistently now. Is this really you, Jerry? Course it's me, man. I'm freaking out, what if those things got Zack? That can't be. The old folks said the beings only take people who know about them. He knew, my neighbor wailed. Overheard us talking the other day. Zack confessed to me and Mel earlier that some strange lady came and tried to coax him outside. He didn't go, cause he didn't recognize her voice. But I think he must have snuck out his window, shimmied down the drain pipe, and she came back for him then. This wasn't a joke anymore. The fear and anguish in Jerry's voice said it all. Something terrible had happened. I quickly yanked open the door. You gonna help me look for him? Jerry stared at me desperately. I'll grab a flashlight. I rushed over and pulled a small flashlight from my nightstand drawer, threw on a jacket, and we hurried out together. The entire house was dark, middle of the night after all. The elderly owners must be sleeping. Dead quiet downstairs. We went outside and started calling out for Zack, sweeping our flashlight beams around the yard. No sign of Melissa anywhere. Look at this. Jerry shouted. There's tracks over here. I crossed the driveway and joined him. Heading into the woods, he said grimly. Kid must have got spooked. You wanna? I hesitated, eyeing the shadowy tree line apprehensively. My son's out there somewhere. You too scared or something? Was he calling me a coward? Lead the way, I mutter. We set off towards the forest. The deeper we trekked, the stronger the winds and colder it became. I was thoroughly creeped out, crunching over fallen branches and rustling leaves. We've gone pretty far in there, I said, shivering violently. I didn't know if Zack would have. I tripped over something heavy and cursed. For a startling moment, I thought I was alone in these oppressive woods. Jerry? You there, man? I cast the flashlight beam around frantically, but my neighbor was nowhere in sight. Just looming black trees. Jerry! My heart was pounding as I slowly turned in a circle, the narrow flashlight beam piercing the gloom. I nearly jumped out of my skin when the light settled on, oh god. I froze in shock and revulsion. Couldn't move, couldn't scream, a damn horror movie cliché. The flashlight illuminated a hand first. 
then an entire body lying in the dirt. Melissa. Her dress was shredded, legs bare and shoeless. Eyes wide, face contorted in an eternal expression of sheer terror. The most ghastly thing was the deep, mottled bruising around her neck. She'd been strangled. Something rustled in the bushes off to my right. I snapped the light over that way with a whipping motion. There was the briefest glimpse of, something, low in the undergrowth before it suddenly burst out, moving with unnatural speed and silence. I came to my senses and just ran. Sprinted like my life depended on it, back towards the direction of home. Away from those accursed woods and whatever existed inside them. Had to get out of this place, far away. When I finally stumbled up to the cottage, out of breath and wheezing, Jerry was outside on the porch steps, head in his hands. Zack's gone, and Melissa, he murmured brokenly when he spotted me. I know. How could I tell him? How could I say those words out loud? I saw, her body. In the woods. He lifted his gaze to me, eyes wet, face crumpling in anguish. I gotta find them, I have to. Jerry, wait. I shouted as he suddenly bolted off the steps, tearing across the yard towards those damned trees. I yelled his name over and over, but he just kept running, disappearing into the blackness between the trunks. A second later, an unholy scream of agony rent the air. Then, nothing. Eerie silence. I shuddered violently. The thought of those, those things coming for me next was overwhelming. The entities had been hunting people for God knows how long. I couldn't bear the idea of being their next victim. With shaking hands, I hurried back inside and raced upstairs. I shoved clothes and essentials haphazardly into a bag. Didn't care if anything got wrinkled, I just needed to get the hell out of this cursed place. Forget this town, this damned forest. How many bodies were rotting away between those trees? Too many, I was sure. Once I had the bare necessities packed, I snatched up my car keys and bolted out of the bedroom, thundering down the stairs. Where you think you're going, young fella? Mildred's raspy voice made me nearly jump out of my skin. She was standing right there in the living room, looking terribly unsettled herself. She reached out those withered hands towards me. I'm leaving. Getting away from here, I told her flatly. Oh no you don't, the old woman cried, grabbing at the sleeve of my jacket and yanking me back. You can't leave now, you belong to them. She jerked her head towards the front windows. I followed her gesture with rising dread. A woman and child were standing outside, faces and hands pressed against the glass, licking their lips obscenely as they stared in at me. You're one of them now, Mildred hissed, close enough that I could smell her stale breath. Can't just walk away, son. With a violent shove, I broke free of the crone's grasp. Get off me, you twisted buzzard. Those, those things took Jerry and his whole family. Course they did. They need you too, honey. Oh they are powerful hungry, a fresh young body like yours will make one hearty meal for them. Then why don't they come after you two relics? I sneered. The old woman cackled, a sound like dead leaves rustling in the wind. Us. We're too old and tough. Wouldn't make for good eaten, is my guess. Stringy old meat ain't what they want. From down the hall, Mildred's husband Jenkins shuffled out of their bedroom and crossed over to me wordlessly. He stretched out one gnarled hand towards the front door latch. The sick old bastard was going to let them inside. I whirled and took the stairs three at a time, ignoring Mildred's cackled urgings to come back. I burst into my bedroom, slamming and locking the door. Crossed to the window and flung it open, sending the curtains billowing. Screw my stuff, there was no time. I simply vaulted over the sill and hung from the frame briefly before dropping the remaining few feet to the ground. I hit the dirt hard and rough scrambled to my feet, chest heaving. My car was only about 30 yards away, but every part of me was screaming to just run, to get as far away from this house of horrors as possible. Stealing my nerves, I sprinted for the vehicle, batting away low-hanging branches that snagged at my clothes and whipped my face. The driver's side door squealed in protest when I finally wrenched it open and threw myself inside. My trembling hands struggled with the key for several agonizing seconds. As the engine finally roared to life, a frantic pounding started up on the rear windshield. I risked a panicked glance in the rearview just as the glass became opaque, 
thick ropes of saliva and handprints distorting my vision. I gunned it, peeling out in a spray of loose gravel as the inhuman pounding intensified. Didn't dare look back as I tore out onto the main road, putting as much distance as I could between me and that convergence of evil dwellings. In my hysterical state, my eyes were drawn to the rear view again despite my attempts to avert them. In the back seat, crouched and waiting, was the wizened, leering face of the old woman. Her lipless mouth curved in an awful grin, yellowed fangs protruding over her cracked, withered gums. I must have cried out, judging by the rawness of my throat, but the next few moments are forever lost to me. Just snippets remain in my fractured memory, the sedan careening off the road, a sickening impact followed by infinite silent blackness. I awoke what felt like years later, covered in thick layers of cobwebs and detritus. Every inch of me screamed with fiery agony. I was, home. Tucked away in the endless, stifling womb of that ancient forest I had so desperately fled. Familiar, tormented faces drifted in and out of my fading consciousness as I was tenderly enveloped in grotesquely loving embraces, soft croons of welcome parting ruined lips. Jerry's pale features loomed closest, what remained of his eyes glittering with profound sadness and regret. I couldn't save them, he seemed to weep. I failed, and now you're one of us. As unconsciousness finally claimed me again, I had